I am recording. I am also recording. You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich, and here with me is... Rish Outfield. Welcome back, Rish Outfield. Welcome back to you, B.D. Anklevich. Well, thank you. How has your week been? I, um... I'm upset because my laptop died. Oh. Sorry. My crap top died. Uh, that sounds more like it. I had had many, many problems with it, but once it was gone, I missed it. Yeah, I know how you feel. I definitely uh, have felt that way about various jobs that I've had in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how you you don't know what you got till it's gone, as the uh, guys in Cinderella once sang. You don't know how it is. Wait, you don't know? Shoot. Now I'm going to have to... Okay, let's sing it together. Hold you on. You don't know what you got till it's gone. Yep. Don't know what you got till it's gone. I don't know what it is I did so wrong. There. Hmm. <laughs> Anyways, yes, those guys from Cinderella, boy, they really shaped a generation, didn't they? Yes. The uh, <laughs> they they were our Beatles, weren't they? That's right. <laughs> I uh, uh I don't know what to say. <laughs> but <laughs> I sort of twisted your arm to make you sit down and do this episode with me because uh, the other day I went to a Barnes & Noble. And if you're listening to this in 2021, Barnes & Noble was a bookstore chain. The last of the bookstore chains. Once the plains of the American West were black with them. (laughs) Not just Barnes & Noble, but Borders... Walden books, bison, <laughs> just just all sorts of uh, bookstores. And uh, I used to, uh, when I had no money, when I lived in California, I would uh, I would go to a bookstore, usually Barnes and Noble, and uh, kill a couple of hours looking at books. Sometimes actually reading them, <laughs> and uh, I I will miss those when they're gone as well. But, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you don't know what you got till it's gone, really. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what it is. They did so wrong. Wrong. <laughs> wrong. Or maybe it's something that Amazon did, right? Uh, wrong and Amazon kind of rhyme. But I, I went to the local Barnes & Noble the other day, and I saw, in the new release section, a book by uh, award-winning author Orson Scott Card. I'm a big fan of Card, especially Ender's Game, and we've mentioned him over and over and over again because both of us went to a book signing when we were in college by him, with him, for him, of him. (laughs) And uh, the book that he just put out, the most uh, recent book, had a very familiar title to me. It was called Lost and Found. Oh, and I thought that that was that was funny because you know I, I I had a story called Lost and Found that I I put out there and ran it on my podcast. Yeah, I listened to that episode of uh, the Rich Outcast. It was a good oh, one. Well, thank you, man. Or two. It was it was two episodes. Wasn't I it? think I split it over two because uh, I need. Uh, I knew one day I would need to buy a new laptop. I think. <laughs> and, <laughs> You you can feel free, listener, if you haven't listened to that episode, go and listen to those. Or you can go buy Lost and Found on Amazon. But just make sure that it's Lost and Found by Rish Outfield and not by Orson Scott Card. My story tells the tale of a boy who has a unique ability. These It's, it's a, a supernatural ability, so to speak. And he... Uh, uses it to find lost objects. And this particular story is about 
the boy being um, sort of dragged into find using his ability to find a lost girl. Uh, you know, a much bigger deal than he's ever been uh, pressed to use his ability for before. Does that is that a good description? Yeah. Of the story. Now, I I was curious about uh, Orson Scott Card's book because I am a big fan. I, I I haven't read everything that he's written, but I was curious. I opened the book and I read the inner flap. And Orson Scott Card's Lost and Found is about a boy who has a very unique ability, a supernatural ability, if you will, of finding lost things, lost items. He makes use of this ability all the time for little things until the police press him to use this ability to find a lost little girl. Holy cow. So when I read that, uh, it, it broke my heart a little bit. <laughs> I, is that the best way to say it? I, it? It didn't upset me so much as it just bummed me out. Because that's not just a close summary of my story, but it is almost an exact summary of my story, which had the same title. And I called you about it because you and I have had this happen to us before. This was not the first time that this had happened. And I thought, well, I need to rant to Big Anklevich that it has happened again. And he, if uh, anybody, will commiserate. And... Uh, I thought that that would make for an interesting episode of our show, talking about this phenomenon, this uh, experience that is not, it, it can't be unique to just us. It has to be something that every, every writer runs into. Am I right? Yeah, I would think so. There, there's a lot of times uh, when something is invented, right? For example, the Wright brothers, in America, the Wright brothers are credited as the first people to do heavier than air flight, right? But in other places, they say that somebody else was the one who did it. And you've seen, I'm sure, like videos of old film that people have where they were testing their flying contraption and there's some crazy ones where you, you see these things and they're just bouncing all over the place and they, they're just these insane looking contraptions trying to fly was it was the zeitgeist or something of the time it was just it was the thing that everybody was trying to do and sooner or later somebody was going to get it and you know at the same time people were doing it all over time we've talked about i'm sure the various um movies where they came out the same summer you had deep impact and armageddon or dante's peak and volcano yeah there you go dante's peak and volcano and it just seemed to keep happening again and again you had ants and a bug's life come out uh the same year and so on and so forth uh, all these kind of things where it was just like that thing was the thing that was just in the zeitgeist or something you know it was just people were going to come up with an idea that is similar. Now, in this case, it seems a little fishy, to tell you the truth. Uh, how long ago did you put out this uh, this episode of The Rich Outcast? I, I think it was just last year. I, the, the, the funniest thing about that is I did an episode about a potential sequel to Lost and Found on The Rich Outcast. And then when I was posting that episode, I thought, well, it would be smart to put a link to when I ran Lost and Found on the Rish Outcast in case they haven't 
listened to it yet. You know, I, I'm doing a whole episode about the sequel. Uh, I should put a link. And there was no link. I, I just couldn't find it. I had never run Lost and Found on the <laughs> Rish Outcast. And so I did a whole discussion of what the sequel might be about. And it was uh, silly, I guess. Uh, but I, <laughs> but yeah, the, the audio book, I think, I, I put out there in 2015, 2014, something like that. And the text was available there. And yeah, that wasn't the worst part of that. The worst part, and I did tell you that when we were on the phone that day, is that I had been mowing the lawn uh, two days before that, or it might have been the exact day before I found Lost and Found by Orson Scott Card. And I was thinking about how my nephew lost one of our turtles, uh, and I, while I was mowing the lawn, I was trying to be very, very careful in case the turtle was in the lawn somewhere. And then I thought, boy, this would be a really good time to have that ability to find lost things that Will, Will Choner has in the story. And so when I was done mowing the lawn, I sat down and I started writing... <laughs> A story, hell, I will share with you that just for extra uh, oomph. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Can I ask you something? Marcellus asked as the gym class trudged across the lawn and back inside, their baseball score immediately forgotten. Will Choner looked up from his mitt. Me? Marcellus was looking at him all right. He was new in school, transferred in from Massachusetts, and always dressed fancier than the other kids in the seventh grade. But he was a heavy kid, and had always strived to get everyone's name right, being friendly with the popular kids, and the ones like Will. Is that story Andrew Staley told true? Will stopped walking. One of the other kids bumped into him, did not apologize, and kept on walking back to school. He didn't like the sound of that question because it was probably about that one thing. He walked on. Nah, he said, quickly changing the subject. I never believed the world was flat, not since I was ten or so. Marcellus didn't bite. No, he said you can transport yourself, like, magically. Will tried not to wince. I, I take the bus, just like everybody else. Sometimes my mom drives me. You know what I mean. He said you call it porting. Will slowed, but did not stop. That was the word that he used, privately, the few times he had talked about his ability. Cody St. Clair knew about it, and Alberta Sorensen, of course, and the twins Justin and Dustin Silverberg, who were best friends with Andrew Staley. It's just a story, he said. He felt Marcellus's plump hand on his shoulder, gentle, but trying to get him to stop. Are you sure? He told me this whole story about you being able to transport to wherever you want, like to Disneyland or Mount Rushmore one time, or to find stuff that's lost, like a comic book and a lost girl and a stolen bicycle. Now Will did stop. This wasn't just a story. It was multiple stories, multiple incidents. The twins had paid him $200 to find the Fantastic Four comic book their dad had left them. It had been in their basement, just in an envelope behind all the bottled fruit their mother was always saving for when World War III broke out, and had sold it for something like $40,000. Everybody knew the story. It had been on the local news, except nobody was supposed to know the part Will Choner had played in it. People tell stories all the time. They say Miss Bigler was born with a wiener and a Vegemite, but nobody believes it. Miss Bigler has a... Marcellus's nose wrinkled up, and Will thought for sure he'd distracted him this time. But he just smiled and shook his head. Makes sense. But can you? Can you really pour it? No, Will said. He didn't want to be rude, but if that's what it took, he was all over it. If I could, don't you think I'd pour it away from this conversation? 
Marcellus thought about it. The lost girl. They say you saved a girl from a, a kidnapper or something. Got your picture in the paper and everything. Nope, Will said again. And that part was at least true. Except for the people directly involved and those classmates he was dumb enough to tell, his involvement in the rescue of Bethany Vance had never been made public. Marcellus searched his eyes, perhaps sensing the truth, perhaps just sure of himself. Could you find something for me, if I asked you to, if it was really important? Will started walking faster, practically jogging. Another old comic book? Maybe a Spider-Man this time? Marcellus matched his stride. I lost my cousin's turtle. It's this, I don't know, green and yellow thing that he's had since he was a baby, and they went to San Diego, and I said I'd take care of it, and I was, but then I had it in the backyard and forgot. But when I went back, it wasn't in the container anymore. Marcellus's breath was starting to come out harder as he struggled to keep up. I looked all over, but I couldn't find it, and now... Will sighed, stopping once again. And now, now my cousin's back, and he's super upset. I, I told him I'd buy him another one, but this turtle was his dad's, and now his dad's not around anymore, and it, like, means something to him that's more than a stupid turtle. I don't know what to do, but... But you heard this story, Will said, shaking his head. This crazy story about me, and you think I can find your lost turtle. Marcellus's eyes were big and soulful. Would you? Would you find it for me? I'd give you whatever you want. Do your homework for you. Carry you on my back whenever Coach LaRocca makes us run. Will thought about it. And something terrible happened. The sides of his mouth started to rise up on their own, and his heart rate started to increase. Something inside him was excited by the prospect, because it gave him an excuse to port again. He pushed the impulse away. Using his power was a little bit like going to porn sites on the internet. The draw was always there, and it got stronger and stronger, got to be all he thought about, if he gave in even a little. Marcellus, he said, and it occurred to him then, what a strange name that was, somehow foreign and old-timey and weird. What if the turtle's dead? The boy's face fell. What? What if I ported, and it turns out it froze to death, or a bird got it? It's too big for a bird. He made a circle with his hands. It's like this big. Okay, but what if it got run over by a car or something? Marcellus thought about it. I guess that would be bad. But my cousin won't let it go, and my mom keeps telling me to go look for it every day. I gotta know. I gotta try. No, he was saying that Will had to try, and of course he would. Why had he even argued about it? I might be able to help you look, Will said quietly, if you will tell absolutely nobody about it. Nobody? Not even your cousin, Will said. How you got it, I mean. Yeah, sure. Will decided to be mean about it. He was 13, after all. And if you call Miss Bigler, Mr. Bigler in computers today. Marcellus recoiled. What? You can pretend it was a mistake or that you stutter or something. I'll be listening in class. And if you do it, then I'll know you're serious. Marcellus shook his head. But I don't like Miss Bigler. I might get in trouble. Nobody likes Miss Bigler. That's the point. The bell rang. They should have been either showering or changing out of their gym clothes right now. Marcellus nodded. All right, I'll call her a sweet transvestite if it gets me that turtle back. Will didn't dare show that he didn't know what a transvestite was. I won't make you go that far. I'm not a monster, man. He started back toward the locker room. Thanks, he heard Marcellus shout behind him. There was excitement and optimism in the fat boy's voice. And Will knew that this was a bad idea. The more people that knew his secret, the more it would get out, and the more like a freak he would feel. But he also knew he'd find that turtle, even if Marcellus chickened out in computer class. There you go. Doesn't that sound like a good place to stop? 
<laughs> You're not going to finish it? You're just going to leave me hanging? Well, that was what I intended to read, was just that seg- section there that I, that I wrote. Uh, okay. I guess we can... We can uh, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to use it in a future ankle cast? I'm oh, sorry, that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to use it in a future Rish Outcast? Or are you going to... What... Well, I I think we can come to a conclusion at the conclusion of this episode, what what I should do. Okay. But yeah, it it did bum me out because uh, I I don't know if it's irony or if it's just, you know, the callousness of the gods. But this was, you know, the day before I discovered this card book that I was writing this sequel. And this isn't even the sequel that I talked about in my Rish Outcast. This is just a little story about... What happens when he goes looking for this, this turtle? But yeah, I I said to you at the time, and I still sort of say it. Should I even bother with this story, uh, knowing that a professional writer has written something so similar and such a big, bigger deal? I mean, his was a novel, whereas mine was a short story or a novella, and this would have been a, a short story and. I just thought it would be neat to write a series of these about, you know, just different missions, I guess you can say. uh, Different times when somebody has asked Will to to use this ability. It just seemed like a superpower that would lend itself to various different adventures. Because it's not just he can find lost things. He can actually transport himself across space to go where he needs to go, where he wants, to, where, you know, where the lost keys are. And uh, that lends itself to all sorts of scenarios. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I find it to be really interesting. And um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my take on it when we get to the end of the episode. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, then... The worst time that this ever happened to me, and it was probably the, the first biggest one, was uh, when I first moved to California to be a screenwriter. Uh, I, I made it a goal to write a screenplay every year. And <laughs> almost, it would take me about a year to write one in those days. And uh, when I finally finished, I would be so proud of myself, proud that I had uh, accomplished this. And my, I briefly, I was uh, roommates with uh, your okay. buddy Ian. He and I were roommates, and I said, oh, you know, well, this might be a fun idea for a script. And I told him about a group of vampires that set up a fraternity on a college campus. You know, it's, it's the, the fraternity of blood kind of thing. And uh, they are picking off the co-eds mm-hmm. left and right, as yeah, you do. Yeah, that's what I usually and, do when I'm a vampire in a fraternity. <laughs> is, is that that's what you do? And uh, the, somebody sets up a, a club on campus uh, to be a vampire hunting club in direct opposition of this fraternity. And Ian thought that this was a great idea. And so I sat down and I wrote this script and it's called The Brotherhood. And uh, it was one of those that, you know, he actually got me meetings with producers to pitch this script and nobody gave (laughs) a crap. (laughs) But about six months to a year later, I went into a video store, I went into Laser Blazer, and uh, I saw in the new releases a horror movie called The Brotherhood. And I picked it up off the shelf, and the blood just drained from my face as I read the description of this movie, which was a, a group of vampires start a fraternity on campus a vampire fraternity and it was called the brotherhood yeah that's crazy and i oh my gosh it just uh, it it really upset me and i called ian and and he 
he also sympathized and told me, oh, shoot, man, that's, that's too bad. I, oh, no. I guess it, eventually we had a laugh about it uh, because like eight months later, The Brotherhood 2 went straight to video. And I was just like, holy crap, dude. And he's like, yeah, that should have been your money, man. <laughs> it's like that goofy guy in the corner on the, the box. That should have been you, man. <laughs> and yeah, as the years went on, I would discover this sort of thing over and over again where, uh, you know, I wrote a story or I was about to write a story and somebody else had written the exact same thing, but it was never quite as bad as The Brotherhood. Until now, until 2019. So um, tell me of a time when this has happened to you and how that felt and then whatever. Well, sure. Uh, uh, the first time that this ever happened to me, and to tell you the truth, I think I may have mentioned this on, uh, on an episode of The Dune Steve before. So if if somebody's a longtime listener, maybe this story will sound familiar. Back when we were both in college, you and I uh, spoke about a particular idea because at the time that we were in college it was the time when a particular special effect became uh ubiquitous it was just in everything and it was the <laughs> the bullet the, time. uh yeah the bullet time the freeze thing you know you could freeze and then swing around to while the thing stayed frozen to a different angle because they'd come up with this thing where it took pictures of something from all angles and then they would make a computer representation a CGI version of it and then you could you could do whatever you want what's in the computer you can spin it all around and they had all these commercials where like somebody had a remote control or something and like a car would jump over a uh, jump and then they would freeze it in midair and then they'd walk under it and like look at it and walk around it and stuff and i just thought oh my gosh that is so cool it is the perfect time for and it, it, this is an idea that i'd had for a long time I'm going all the way back to when i was a young man i had you know the idea of how neat it would be if you could freeze time uh, you froze time and you were the one person who wasn't frozen. Everyone else was frozen and you could go and do whatever you wanted. You could, I don't know, rob a bank or uh, whatever and no one would know because time would be frozen and, you know, the money would be there and then one second and then the next second it would be gone because in the interim you walked in there, emptied the vault and left and... Everyone else was frozen in time while that happened. I just thought that would be neat. And I thought, oh, man, I need to come up with an idea to go along with that now because the technology is here. It's ready for time to be frozen. And you and I talked about it. I remember one day on the phone, we talked about it for a while and maybe brainstormed a little bit of ideas. I, I vaguely remember our conversation. I remember saying... Well, yeah, we've seen a bunch of movies or TV shows where somebody moves really fast. But this isn't that. This isn't a guy moving fast. He's stopping everybody else. And he just moves regular speed, but everybody else is frozen. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we had seen, I, I remember there being one of those little commercial things before the movies that showed how this amazing special effect was done where they had a bunch of cameras like you said <laughs> lined up next to each other and they they were doing a, a, a like a bar fight scene where a guy gets thrown through the window of a bar and they had set up these cameras by the window and they showed you know in regular speed how fast throwing the guy through the window was and then they showed their footage using all the cameras and yeah the the camera moves around this guy as he's flying through the glass. I'm sure you saw that too, because we went to a ton of movies when we were in college. <laughs> yeah, it's probably how I learned how it was done, I'm sure. So, you know, we talked about it, and I remember thinking, oh, I'd come up with a good story that could go with it. At that time, I wasn't really much of a writer, I have to admit. 
I hadn't really pushed myself in storytelling very much. I know that we had a screenwriting class together and uh, I don't know what the deal was, but my stories just sucked in screen. I think it was because I was like thinking as a artsy fartsy filmmaker kind of a guy instead of just thinking about the kind of things that I liked. So the stories that I wrote were boring. They weren't interesting, and yeah, they were just terrible. So, uh, you know, I I was not really prepared to be able to just jump out there and and write this this story idea, but the idea was there, and you and I talked for for a very short time about, you know, what uh, you could do, and then... We did nothing with it. I, I didn't write it. I It was one of those things where, you know, I, as a writer, I've always just, you know, I, I put something in my idea drawer or something like that, and it just kind of sits. And every now and then I'll take it out and think about it a little bit, and then I'll just put it back in there. And eventually something will happen to the point where I finally will go with that idea and I'll write it. So that's, I guess, what I was doing with this one. You know, the idea of someone freezing time, that went into the drawer and sat. Then one day I was walking through the mall and there was a poster in the mall. This was two, three years later, probably. Walking through the mall and there was a poster in the mall for an upcoming movie. And I saw that poster there and I went, oh, crap. I'm too late. The poster was for a movie called Clock Stoppers, which is a big classic. Everyone knows and loves this movie. Clock Stoppers took the world by storm. And yeah, I, it, it's too late to do that idea anymore. I'd say that Clock Stoppers was the Cinderella of filmmaking <laughs> from that era. <laughs> that's, that's definitely true. It was... It was our generation's Titanic. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Titanic was our generation's Titanic. Ah, that slipped your mind there. Yeah, I told you before that Jonathan Frakes directed Clock Stoppers, and I, I think it's the only movie, non-Star Trek movie, he directed. Uh, but I never saw it, and you did. But- I did see it, yeah. And it was what you were talking about, where uh, apparently the way that they freeze time is they're actually just moving really, really, really fast. And oh. so they're, they're just going so much faster than everybody else that it seems like they've frozen time, but they actually haven't. Oh, well, that's your, not your idea at all. Why would they call it clock stoppers then if it's just they're moving really fast? I don't know. Uh, because it seemed like they were stopping the clock or something, I guess. I don't know. It... I did see it. It wasn't particularly awesome. It was a teenage kind of comedy adventure kind of thing. It was okay. It didn't have a lot to it. I don't know that my idea would have had more to it. Well, but your idea, they actually would have stopped clocks. <laughs> right. For those liars. And I suppose that it's still open. I could still do that as we... Uh, sarcastically put it you know it's not remembered most people probably listening to me tell this story right now have never heard of clock stoppers probably uh so i guess i could still write that story i mean it's still an interesting idea but i still don't have a story to go with it i don't have characters i don't have a plot maybe i just gave up on it because of clock stoppers and i haven't developed it since but That was the first time that something like that happened to me where I just was like, oh man, oh no, it's too late. I should have written that story and now it's gone. Of course, in those days, I was still thinking like I was some kind of a filmmaker and I was like, I should have written that script and made that movie and I could be a bajillionaire with the money from the movie. Not not quite understanding that that was never going to (laughs) happen. Even if I had written the script, it was never going to happen. Somebody else would have made it instead and called it The Brotherhood. Oh, called it The Brotherhood. Ooh, you bastard. (laughs) Well, there's the pain 
of writing something and then something else comes out. And then there's how I felt in the middle of writing a, a second story. I called it Turtle Hunt, which is not a great title, but that was the title I had at the time. But there's, you know, the feeling of I'm in the middle of this and there's no point in continuing that has happened to me a, a, a bunch of times. I just It's not just the Brotherhood and Lost and Found. It tends to happen over and over again as I see more movies or read more short stories or just am alive and continue to be a creative person that writes stuff. And to be honest, it, it never hurt as bad as it did th- that first time with the Brotherhood, with me. I, I, I remember you having this idea of a kid's book or a series of kid's books. And I don't know how serious you were about it, but you came, you had this idea and you're going to write a story called... The Alphabots. And you told me about the Alphabots, Alphabots. and you kind of had a, an idea of at least what, you know, two or three of them would, would be like. And uh, this was when you had kids that were about in the target audience that the Alphabots Alphabots would be be. aimed at. This is something that you and I would do all the time. It's like, oh, I've got an idea for this. Oh, that sounds good. I've got an idea for this. Oh, that that sounds pretty good. You should write it. But I remember you coming to me and saying, ah, I discovered that there already is an Alphabots Alphabots. out there. Somebody else has already done it. Uh, Well, I guess I won't be writing it now. Yeah, some somebody had done a kids book of it, just a little, you know, short one of one of the, you know what I'm talking about, like just size of a of a small Dr. Seuss book or something like that. I, it was probably not even in print anymore, it was, but you know, this guy had copyright or whatever on this term, the Alphabots, and when it, when it comes down to it, the Alphabots was. The thing, like the the name right there is the thing. And that, it sells itself, really. You just go to the PBS kids' offices and you say, okay, here's the idea. The Alphabots. Alphabots. And they're like, oh, sold. Uh, Get this man a cigar. Yeah. They're just like, after, after that, they're like, okay, now tell us what it is. What's it going to be? And then you're like, okay, well, there's this uh, uh, this perverted guy. And they're like, okay, I like it still. <laughs> you know, it could be anything. Once you've got the Alphabots, the Alphabots. You're, it's sold. It, you, basically, my idea was it was a Dora the Explorer kind of a thing where there was this kid and they had to go somewhere or do something. And he had a backpack, maybe, full of... Alphabot, Alphabot toys and each time they had to do something the maybe the robots would come with them or something but you know they had to figure out something that just happened to start with the letter R and so R bot would come out and and help him and they would and you know it was be learn to read kind of a thing and I just thought oh my gosh it's the perfect idea you know this you always talk about how the guy who wrote the I'm the map song which goes, I'm the map, 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 I'm the map. That's not the whole song. There is a, a one verse, I think. I think it goes, if there is a place you want to go, I can get you there. You know, I'm the map. If there's a place you need to be, I'm the one you need to see. I'm the map. And then it goes into that tale out that I gave you. Oh, let's see. I... I hadn't heard the extended mix, the dance remix. So uh, I, all the nasty things I've said about this guy over the years, I, I'll have to take back. Because I, I didn't realize the, the brilliance of I'm the You used map. to joke about how that guy owns his own house because of writing the map song. And, and how unfair that was. Yeah, and how much uh, you and I should own our own house because... We thought of the Alphabots Alphabots. or whatever. The Brotherhood. I do remember telling you that when you sell this show, please bring me on to write an episode, please. And you're like, yeah, sure, sure. And I said, and I want to do the one about F-Bot. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) Take it back. You can't write an episode. (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, FBOT uh, has become a reality these days. There's a website <laughs> you can go to. Thank goodness. <laughs> But anyways, yeah, that was another one of those things where, yeah, I mean, in this case, it was it was a great idea. And sadly, it's it wasn't even exploited to its full potential. You know, that could have been so much more than what, you know, the guy that I'm talking about did. He just did a a simple little children's book and and it's done. But yeah, it should be an empire of things. It's Dora the Explorer for boys, basically, you know. It's it's <laughs> it's go Diego go. <laughs> because yeah, you put robots uh into a thing and I and I even had like, you know, the the main kid was going to be like TJ or JT or BJ or CJ or I don't know, some one of those names where his his name is an abbreviation, it's two letters. And I, I think I may have even decided I would call it, you know, like BJ and the Alphabots. Alphabots. And you said, all right, I'm ready for the F-Bot episode now. Now I've got extra ideas. Uh, I knew a guy named BJ. <laughs> he, I, a guy that I went to high school. Unfortunately, we've got to put a an explicit warning on this again. <laughs> thanks to you and your horny friend. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, my this the class president every year was this guy named BJ. <laughs> you wonder how he got so many votes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I don't know how long an episode we want this to be, but I could give more examples of times where I'm like, oh no, that's just like this thing that I wrote. And and you, why why don't you give another example? Yeah, I, I, I got to give at least one more because I can remember one more. <laughs> I've, I've, there's probably others, but I can't remember them. So we'll, we'll, I'll give one last example. And this will be good and fresh because we just ran the story that goes with it. I guess probably by the time this episode, this That Gets My Goat episode comes out, we'll have a new episode up. But the episode before the most recent episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction magazine was a story that I wrote called Fireflies. And this happened, uh, you know, I wrote the story before the ripoff ever came along. You know, the people who were ripping me off and stealing all my money by using my idea without paying me (laughs) (laughs) for it. Yeah, that's right. I remember uh, I was just looking at like synopses of movies that were going to be coming out. And there was one and I, I, I called you up or I forwarded you the paragraph that said the name of this movie and what the premise was. And it was similar, not identical, but it was similar enough that I sent it to you just to be an asshole. (laughs) <laughs> yes, thank you very much. But yeah, the weird thing is, I I don't even remember what the movie was called, but I remember I yeah either. the the premise was close enough. And and this is a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't listened to Fireflies. You should probably pause this episode, go listen to Fireflies, which is a two episode thing, and then come back to listen to me tell the rest of the story because I'm going to spoil the the story for you right now. But yeah, basically, Fireflies is about a baby who is born and he has a supernatural ability where if he, when he goes into deep sleep and starts dreaming, his dreams are created in the real world. So things from his dream appear in real life. And that was the original idea. I wrote the story. And I wrote it on the blog. So it was it was out there. Well before we just did the episode on the Dune Steve. Then you sent me that uh, thing saying, oh yeah, here's here's this. And it was a horror story about somebody whose dreams manifest themselves in real life. And I went, oh crap. I'm too late to get a movie deal from Firefly. <laughs> I should have been... Shopping it around. I don't know. I, I wasn't going to do anything like that. So it <laughs> didn't really matter. But but yeah, it, there was another thing that got got snagged out from under me. Somebody else had the same idea that I had. 
And I'm sure, I guess, when it really comes down to it, probably 50 other people had that same idea. And 45 of them probably did nothing with it. And then five of us actually did something with it. Four of us are completely unknown. And then there's the guy who made the movie off of it uh, that you sent me. Well, there's the X-Men character who has the same problem. Their mutant power is that when they they dream, what they dream manifests in real life. Oh. I thought you had brought that to my attention. I am unaware of that X-Men character, I think, actually. There's a character that, that does that? Well, it was at the Xavier School. A, a kid, one of the students, had this affliction. Huh. Um, and so the parents sent them to the Xavier School where somebody could, you know, help control this curse. Yeah, that would be a good way to have saved Trevin. <laughs> Rhymes with Devin. <laughs> if only there was really a school for gifted youngsters. But yeah, that was that was just another one of those that the same ideas out there and you know, it it happens. And I don't get too upset over it either. I don't know. This is something that I have said multiple times, and probably you have as well, that usually when somebody decides that they're going to be a writer, they either read something that speaks to them, that inspires them, that encourages them, that opens up their eyes to what storytelling can do, or they read something that sucks. Uh huh. And they think, I can, I can do, do better, better than, than that. that. And yeah, with our experiences, I, you know, I never, I see, I wasn't the glutton for punishment that you are. I, I never sat down and rented the Brotherhood or the Brotherhood 2 or the Brotherhood 3. And at this point, there's probably seven of them. Uh, I just didn't want to put myself through that. It just hurt too much. And sometimes when there is a movie that has the same premise or a story that has a similar premise, I will just stay away from it. As though it could somehow come up later. Where it was like, oh, did you ever see that movie where the woman had full-on intercourse with the creature from the Black Lagoon? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, well, I saw it, but I had written mine for... Uh, 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 Your Honor, this is clearly a hostile witness. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I was always afraid that somebody would say, well, did you see? Mm -hmm. Well, then I rest my case, Your Honor. Uh-huh. You still have plausible deniability, is what you're saying. I guess so. I, I, I don't know. It's so few people have ever read anything that I have written that it shouldn't matter. But at the same time, I just feel like someday somebody might. <sighs> but, but I guess the, the, the point I was going to make, despite having talked about it for nearly an hour, is that uh, it doesn't bother me as much as it did years ago. And I think it bothers me a little bit less every time that it happens. Because I, I've discovered that every story comes from somewhere else. Everybody has been influenced by something. Right. Um, you know, and, and that was one of the reasons it upset me so much in 2009 when people were saying, Avatar is just dances with wolves, man. Avatar is just Pocahontas, man. And I'd be like, but it isn't. It isn't that. It has some things in common with it, but then it made its own thing. Everything is like something else, but with something just nudged a little bit differently. Uh, and that has helped me sleep at night a lot of times when uh, I discover, I, I, somebody told me, Oh, you know, there is a weird Western very much like your uh, Into the Furnace book. And I was just like, oh, okay. I'm glad that I didn't know about that because it might have prevented me from writing that book. Right. But because I didn't know about it, I wrote it. And whether mine is better than theirs or theirs is a hell of a lot better than mine, you know, they're both out there. I, I, and I think there's room for both, you know, Orson Scott Card's lost and found and, and, and Rish Outfield's lost and found. And, you know, even if there isn't, 
it's healthier for me to believe that there is. Because uh, goodness knows, I, I, I don't need more stumbling blocks to my uh, confidence and writing career and all that. But I thought that probably the best person to ask would be Orson Scott Card. And so I asked him about it. And a part of me thought that Card would be like, you're saying I stole your story? F*** you. Get out of here. You know, it's like, <laughs> guard, seize this man. Seize him. And he's like, get my Lucille bat right now. But no, he said, uh, well, let me just play with what he said. Oh my How gosh. often does that happen to you as a writer? And does it ever bother you? Or does it doesn't bother me in the least because just, you know, if I write something and somebody says, well, this is just like what Paul Anderson did. Cool. Great minds think alike. Because it, the idea you had, you would have written it very differently. It would have been different characters. It would have felt different to the people reading it. Might have been just as successful. And we never met. So, you know, nobody stole anything from anybody else. You can't steal ideas. They're all there. You know, if you read it and you think it's a cool idea and you want to write a story that has the same premise, go for it. You know, we all steal from each other. <laughs> but it didn't bother you when you were first starting and you discover, oh, Bradbury wrote a story similar They to this. all have been written. Oh. I have never had an original idea and neither has anyone else. Every single Shakespearean play except for the worst one, Mary Wives of Windsor, was based on a story by somebody else, usually somebody who already had written it into a play, that he was going to get beat, but he would steal their plots and write a better one. Uh, and so if Shakespeare can do it in that era before copyright, I feel no qualms about, you know, if I want to write a story about Hamlet, I can too. It's just, you know, it's one of the, one of the rules. You can't actually steal somebody's idea. You can steal their language, but plagiarism only applies to language. It doesn't apply to ideas. So if you want to take the plot of Gone to the Wind and go scene by scene, if it's scene by scene, then somebody might may be able to make a case. But she's dead, you know. <laughs> so. Oh, all right. But in the end, he did call the guards and have you dragged off. Yeah, that's the funny put thing. In, is he put in a gulag so that you wouldn't be remembered ever by anyone, right? <laughs> he waited until I had stopped the recording, and then he yeah he just snapped his fingers, and these guys. These wow, guys. he didn't even have to say anything. He just snapped. That's impressive. Yeah. These hulking gay <laughs> men stepped out in turtlenecks and leotards, and they, uh, yeah, they pummeled me good. Man. As well you deserve. And, and broke my laptop. Oh, darn. So that's how that happened? Did you say it was well-deserved? <laughs> hey. <laughs> <sighs> I think the audience probably agrees with that, but still. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> oh yeah you know it's interesting that that's what card says and that's what you say because that's totally how, how i feel as well there is room for all different types i think there is room for deep impact and armageddon there's room for dante's peak and volcano you know there's room for I mean, there are people that are fans of Deep Impact. Wait, wait, wait. What, what about Independence Day and Mars Attacks? Well, th there's no room for Mars Attacks in any dimension. You know, that's that's just... I mean, those are uh, sort of similar, but and they, I guess they came out at the same time, but they're so different that... Yeah, there's definitely room for that. And that, and I guess that really uh, highlights what I was going to say, is that every single person that writes a story writes a different story. I, You know, there should be a podcast out there that sometimes does this, where they just, they, they just have an event. I don't know what they could call it, like a, a shattered glass or, or something like that, where, you know, they just give everybody the same premise. And they say, you know, write a story based on this premise and then we'll judge the stories and decide which one's the best. And then we'll just run them on the show. If there was a show out there that did that, it would it would be a huge hit. Everybody out there would be listening to that show because it would be great. You know, that somebody ought to do that because you, you would see that 
everybody writes the story a little different. And there is room for dozens of different stories that come from the same premise because they're not going to be the same. It's, it's just impossible. They're, they're going to be so different, each different person writing from the same premise that wouldn't matter. They could even have the same title. They could all be called Lost and Found and they would still be completely different things. Unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't get hauled off to court by somebody. Some Harlan Ellison may just be like, yeah, you stole my idea and I want money. You know, right now Led Zeppelin is back in court again, I think, because somebody's claiming that they stole Stairway to Heaven. You know, that it's too similar to this other song and they deserve credit or whatever. Just that's the way human beings are. I believe there was somebody, somebody famous who said that they stood on the shoulders of giants. And that somebody who I believe was Isaac Newton. So yeah, this guy who came up with so many important things in the modern world, the stuff that a lot of our science is based around, understood that, you know, he wasn't the one that, that came up with it all by himself. But, you know, humanity in general just builds and builds and builds. Every generation, every person it adds. You know, it's all one big plus, plus one, plus one more, plus one more. We're always just adding on the stuff that other people have done. And yeah, Card's probably right. There are no new ideas. Everything's been done. Even Shakespeare, apparently, is stealing his stuff. I mean, he totally didn't make up that Julius Caesar play because I've heard that story before. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that the turtle story should be finished. I don't think you should stop where you let off there on us. You, I think you should finish it. And the sequel that you talked about in your episode that came out before <laughs> the story itself did... I think you should do that too. You know, who cares if Orson Scott Card wrote a similar story? He didn't write your story. Um, so, you know, it's not like he just copied it word for word and put it out. At least, I don't think so. You didn't, you, did you read the book? Did you see if he just copied it word for word? <laughs> well, there, there are differences in just the details on the flap. I haven't bought the book. I considered buying it and then I thought, no, that's just cruel. And then I, and you I am need planning. plausible deniability. Yes, I need the plausible deniability, and I am planning on having my laptop break. So I'm going to need all the money that I can manage. Right. But I did check, and I think you checked at your library, and both of our libraries have the book. So I thought, well, I will read it or listen to the audiobook, and uh, maybe we'll follow this up one day talking about it. Yeah, it's a good idea. And you're really well known for doing the healthy and most professional thing usually. So it's good that you uh, are keeping that, that up. Well, that is all the time we've got for today, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, you ended that on a, on a note. I'm not going to say a positive note, but uh, definitely there was, there was notes involved. Yeah, there were notes. <laughs> I would love to hear from the listener to hear how they have experienced this. If, if that's happened to you as a writer, I, I, I would be curious. And how did you feel and what did you do about it? And uh, what should I do about it? Tell me what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have been uh, Rich Outfield, author of A Lost and Found. All right, and I am Big Anklevich, author of A Fireflies. <laughs> 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 Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, yeah, let us know in the comments if anything interesting has happened to you like that. We'd love to hear it. We'll see you next time. Good night. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Apparently, the creative in creative commons doesn't mean anything.
And basically he said, everybody, no, there's no new ideas. Shakespeare stole all of these plays and wrote his own versions. He just did it better. And that's why we know all Shakespeare stuff. So there is, there's no such thing as an original idea. And then he said, guards, seize him. I, I had turned off the recording at this point. Seize him. I don't know. Maybe we, we can use it as an outtake if you want. I'll, I'll read it and you can tell me afterward uh, whether to leave that as a, a story proper or as an outtake. I'm just vamping while I'm trying to open the fucking file because, of course, <laughs> I'm using my computer which is still almost as slow as my crap top was. Yeah, still, still hasn't opened. <sighs> but yes, yeah, so don't forget, eventually we are going to talk about your examples of uh, this happening, or, or a couple examples of this happening. To yeah. me. Still hasn't opened the goddamn email. Sorry, I'm blown away that it can take this long. You should see me in the morning trying to race before the mailman gets here. And it's like, it should not take 20 minutes to print a friggin' label. <laughs> um, it shouldn't, actually. So. Yeah, there's somebody in Brazil. Brazilians claim that a guy named Alberto Santos Dumont was the first person to fly an airplane. Although I'm looking at it and it... It appears like it's years after the Wright brothers. I don't understand. The Wright brothers were 1903. Well, I don't know. Is it possible that Brazil was so backward that they hadn't heard of what the Wright brothers had done and they had done this completely independent of them? In this article here, it was on November 12th, 1906, when Santos Dumont flew a kite-like contraption with boxy wings called the 14 Bis, some 722 feet on the outskirts of Paris. It being the first public flight in the world, he was hailed as the inventor of the airplane all over Europe. It was only later that the secretive Orville and Wilbur Wright proved they had beaten Santos Dumont at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, three years earlier on December 17th. But to bring up the Wright brothers with a Brazilian is bound to elicit an avalanche of arguments, some more reasonable than others, as to why their compatriots' flight didn't count. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Why did the Wright brothers keep it a secret? I don't know. Because of patents or because, you know, they, they, they wanted to be able to replicate this before somebody figured out how they did it and they could do their own? Yeah, I don't know. Which Carolina were the Wright brothers from? North Carolina. Do they say smash the button? <laughs> mash the button, yeah. Oh, Just mash, mash, not smash. Sorry, I, I can't remember. So does it open yet? Button. No! Should I mash the button? Like, no, no, please be very careful with the camera. I, I, I... <laughs> We'll need to use it again. I laughed pretty loud when you said that, and then I laughed <laughs> when I edited it. What did you... <laughs> wow. Gmail is just blank now. It's not even uh, trying to spin. It's just an empty shell, like my soul. For both out there, I think there's room for Orson Scott Cards. Lost and found, and my lost and found. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's super naive. Maybe I need to go back and retitle. No, mine. you're you're skipping to the end here. Well, that was supposed to be my big thing that I was going to say when we got to the end of the episode. <laughs> oh well, I was trying to sum up there because I figured this is boring as hell for the listener. Am I right? Oh, I don't know. I thought it's been fine so far. So should I just read a little bit more of it, or is that? dumb sure i'll sit and listen to it oh okay you do remember lost and found right yeah okay oh you said you had listened to that episode recently so i guess i'll read a little bit more all right let's get this done will said as they walked into marcellus's kitchen it looks like it's gonna rain again rain's good for turtles my mom said the fat boy went to the refrigerator and opened it it was a huge stainless steel contraption with two ice makers and LED lights that slowly came on when you opened the door, like a robot waking up in the morning. What do you want to drink? Water's always good, Will said. 
amazed that Marcellus knew so much about his ability. Whenever Will ported, he became seriously dehydrated, and his mother worried that the process did something to his plasma or red blood cells or something. But his classmate wasn't talking about that. We've got Pib Extra, three different Mountain Dews, and both Cherry Coke and Cherry Dr. Pepper. Oh, Will said, seeing the rainbow of soft drinks lined up in one section of the big fridge. I'll take a cherry one. The house was big and impressive, with wood floors and tall windows and panel lighting and prints on the walls of seaside cottages and fishing boats that were framed and appeared to be signed by the artist. Okay, anything you need beforehand? Marcellus asked. You don't need a picture of the turtle, do you? Do you have one? No, but I could look one up on the internet. They're called sliding turtles, I'm pretty sure. Will shook his head. That wouldn't help. He knew from experience that trying to port to something using a photograph rarely worked. He might end up in Zimbabwe or wherever the picture of that particular turtle was taken. Do you have, you know, something that belonged to the turtle? Like its food, you mean? Well, no, something that actually made contact with it. Like a collar if this was a lost dog we were looking for. Oh, Marcellus thought about it. Not that I can think of. Titus has most of that stuff. Titus is your cousin, Will guessed. That was a weird name, too, though not quite as weird as Marcellus, although his last name was Choner, so he didn't think he should bring it up. Right. He has this big tank he puts it in, has a bubble maker and heater and everything. He sometimes buys goldfish to feed it with. It kind of makes me sick to see the turtle go after them, but... Titus saves up his allowance every week to buy more. Marcellus got a faraway look on his face, then came back to the conversation. I don't have any of that, though. Will sighed. Maybe we could just go outside and look for it the old-fashioned way. No, the fat boy exclaimed. He sounded on the verge of crying, which, for a seventh grader, was worse than death. I've tried that. I've gone over every inch of that freaking backyard and it's not there. Unless it dug a hole and buried itself somewhere. Do turtles do that? I don't know. It wasn't my pet, Marcellus said. And there it was again, an exasperation that was practically grief. Okay, let's go out and try this, Will said. But he was starting to suspect this wouldn't work. In the past, he'd found lost things by concentrating, by really wanting to get them back, or by just imagining that he'd already found them. But those were usually things he had already touched, or seen his mother or his Uncle Armin with. He didn't even know what kind of turtle he was looking for, except that it was yellow and green and ate live goldfish. They stepped out, sodas in hand. Marcellus had an orange kind of Mountain Dew Will had never seen before to the house's backyard. It was immense, bigger than any yard he'd ever seen outside of a farm, and his whole apartment and its bathroom would fit on just the lawn. No wonder the turtle was hard to find. The backyard was all fenced in, but included a garden, a deck, three trees, a tennis court, and a shed that Marcellus said had tools in it. Oh, and a hot tub, covered in some kind of stretchy canvas. Did you check the pool? Will said, immediately concerned. My sister said the same thing. It's a jacuzzi, but there's no way an animal could get in it. Well, did you check it? Will asked, wondering what would happen to him, exactly, if he poured it into a covered hot tub. He'd get wet, at the very least. Yeah, twice. Will surveyed the grass, the flowers, trees and all the little hiding places around them. One half of the backyard was walled off, separating the property from another three-story rich person's house. The other two sides were fenced in with a gate. At least the turtle couldn't get out of the yard. I would have to finish it if, if for it to be worth anything. It's not, it's not done. It's, once I discovered my conundrum, I, you know, I, I lost the enthusiasm for it. But... Running it on the show like this means that somebody somewhere will be like, hey, Rish, did you ever finish that story? And if you didn't, you're a ball sack, you know, and that that always feels good. 
Okay, let me finish this bit. Your cousin didn't have any pictures of it he could send you. Well, he might. I didn't ask him. Too bad there's not a whistle you could blow, like one of those ones that call dogs, Will said. Or ducks that hunters use. Will closed his eyes. He wanted to port and do it soon, but it would be for nothing if he didn't know where he was porting to. This is the container it was in, Marcellus said, pointing to a Tupperware bowl lying on the patio table. It was small, the size you'd put leftover pizza in. Wait, the turtle was that little? Will asked. Yeah, Titus says they lived for like 40 years and it wasn't full grown yet. Will's eyes went back to the gate on the, rear, on the near side of the yard. A turtle that size could easily go under the gap at the bottom of it. He pointed it out. It could be anywhere then, Marcellus realized. I thought for sure it was still out here somewhere. Will Choner held out his hand. Well, let's find out. Marcellus gave him a slap on the hand, but that's not what Will had been after. The container, he said. If the turtle was in it, I think it'll work. And that had always seemed to be the key to his power, believing it would work. When his dad had been alive and showed him how to do it, he had always stressed that you had to believe you'd be okay when you traveled somewhere, and you'd never appear inside a wall or under a building or anything. Fat lot of good belief had done Elmer Choner, of course. Will took the plastic container, held it in both of his hands, and concentrated on the animal that used to be inside it. He still didn't know what the turtle looked like exactly, but he told himself that he was about to find out. He ported. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 